Um, thank you for that introduction, and, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about um, some of the work that we're doing in my laboratory at UW. Um, it's also really a pleasure to see this partnership um, taking shape and to meet with the, the medical students today. Um, I was really impressed with the students and the questions that they asked, and, and I think this is a, a really fantastic um, partnership um, with a lot of momentum. So, um, so my lab works on the basic biology of aging, uh, and what I want to do today is, is um, sort of give you uh, an idea of why I think that aging is uh, an area of research that we should be interested in and everybody should be excited about. And then I'll tell you about how we're um, trying to take some of what we've learned in the laboratory and actually bring that out into the real world, um, not in people right away, but first in our, in our pets and our pet dogs in particular. Um, so I wanna start by just making the point that not everybody <laughs> appears to age exactly the same way. Um, and I think these two individuals uh, illustrate this point nicely. So um, uh, I'm, I'm guessing from the laughter that, that many of you recognize at least one of these individuals, um, Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. Um, and then of course Patrick Stewart uh, is a famous uh, actor and entertainer, sort of my uh, first uh, memories of Patrick Stewart was as Captain Picard in the um, Star Trek The Next Generation, but he's also been in the X-Men films and lots of other things. Um, the point here is that if you look at these two individuals, you wouldn't necessarily guess that Patrick Stewart is actually older than Keith Richards. Um, I like this comparison as well because it, it sort of makes the point, at least to me, that aging, an apparent rate of aging in, in people um, is not only about genetics, and genetics are important, but equally important, maybe more important, is environment and some of the, the, the ways that our environment influences us. And for any of you who know anything about Keith Richards, I think it's probably fair to say that some of his environmental choices have potentially influenced his potential rate of aging. And I love this picture of Patrick Stewart. I'm a huge Seahawks fan, season ticket holder, and I love this picture of him doing a one-arm push-up the year the Seahawks uh, won the Super Bowl. Um, so our environment and our, the choices that we make to some extent, sometimes we can't control our environment, influences our, the, the way we age maybe as much, maybe more as the genes that we're born with. So aging is a genetic and environmental uh, uh, condition. And if we can understand what these genetic and environmental components are, we have the opportunity potentially to modulate the aging process. And that's really the sort of fundamental goal in my lab and lots of other labs who work um, in this field. Um, so, so when I talk about aging, um, I think it's, it's, it's really important to think about disease, right? And, and this is really what the, the, the biomedical research community is focused on, is disease. Um, and we talk a lot about risk factors. If you go to your physician, your physician will have a discussion with you about some of the risk factors for these various um, diseases that you can potentially modify to decrease your risk of developing these diseases. Um, and that's important. But what gets lost sometimes in that discussion is that all of these diseases have a single greatest risk factor. And it's the same single greatest risk factor. And it's not how much you eat or whether you smoke or how much alcohol you consume. It's how old you are. Um, so it's really aging that drives, to a great extent, your risk of developing all of these different diseases that are the major causes of death and disability in the United States and other developed countries. And um, I'm not gonna show a lot of data tonight, but I think it's useful to actually illustrate this point with some numbers. So these are the major risk factors that you will usually hear about for heart disease. If you have high blood pressure, or if you smoke, or if you have high cholesterol, or if you have diabetes, your risk goes up uh, for developing these diseases. But if we compare that to the increase in your risk for heart disease from just two decades, that data is still there. You see those small bars at the bottom. It dwarfs these other risk factors. You can look at all, all causes of cancer, so all different types of cancer, again, the, the, the risk factors that we all know about, and this is that impact of 20 years. 
Um, and this is the, a big one, right, Alzheimer's disease. This is one that all of us, as we're getting older, are concerned about, and many of us have loved ones who have experienced Alzheimer's disease. And these are the major risk factors. So APOE actually is the greatest genetic risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, about a five-fold increase in risk if you have the wrong version of that gene. And this is the increase in risk from getting older. Um, and I think this is really important, and I know this is kind of a downer, I'm sorry, uh, but, <laughs> but I think this is really important because I think that um, one of the reasons why as a research community we have not been as successful as we would have hoped at curing these diseases, and Alzheimer's disease in particular, is because by and large, the research community hasn't appreciated that we need to understand why this is a disease of aging if we want to be able to prevent it. It's, it and so, so that's really, I think, an important message that I want to get across is once somebody has developed Alzheimer's disease, it's really hard to fix that. But if we can understand Alzheimer's disease from the perspective of aging, we have a much greater chance of keeping people from developing Alzheimer's disease. And I think that's probably true for all of these other diseases of aging as well. So I think of this as 21st century medicine. Instead of waiting for people to get sick and trying to cure their disease, what, what I want to do, and the, the people who study the biology of aging, is try to understand aging at a fundamental level so we can potentially modify aging to decrease the risk of developing these diseases, all of them at the same time. So slowing aging should slow the progression of all of these age-related diseases, um, at least in theory. Obviously, we haven't done that yet in people. And I think it's useful to, this is a little bit more, uh, little bit more data, to actually look at some numbers here. So demographers um, have taken a look at the CDC. So the CDC is really good at, at keeping track of what people die from and when they die from these diseases. And so demographers have taken that data and asked, well, what would happen to life expectancy if we just took out one disease at a time? And it turns out that for a 50-year-old woman, typical 50-year-old woman, if, if we cured all forms of cancer, the war on cancer was won, that would give you about a three to five year increase in life expectancy. Now, I don't know if that number seems big to you or small to you, but to me, I was surprised at how small that number is. Now, I don't want to minimize at all the importance of curing individual people's cancer. That is hugely important. But at a societal level, the impact is relatively modest from, from curing cancer. Even if we cured four of the major killers, cancer, heart disease, stroke, kidney disease, that gets you about a decade increase in life expectancy, again, for a typical 50-year-old woman. Um, now, if we compare that to the effect of slowing aging, which, which is fairly routine now in laboratory models, um, you get a much greater increase in life expectancy with the added benefit that those extra years are spent in relatively good health. And this is a, a concept called the longevity dividend. That term was coined by a demographer named J. L. Shansky to sort of illustrate this idea that targeting aging directly potentially has a much greater impact on health um, for people. And the last point that I want to make in this part of my talk is um, I'll, I'll do this throughout my talk, and in the field we do this. We talk a lot about lifespan because that's something that we can measure. We can tell if we can extend the lifespan of an animal. Um, but what's really important here isn't how long you live, it's the quality of those years. And so I want to I emphasize this idea of health span because that's really what we're after. What we want to do is take the diseases of aging and push them back as far as possible late into life and maximize the, the healthy period of life, so maximize health span. Um, so that's the ultimate goal. Okay, so um, I've got a few of these take-home messages, I think three of them, that if you, if you walk out of here tonight and you just you remember anything, I hope you remember these take-home messages. And the first one is, um, so I've been up here talking about slowing aging, and to people who aren't familiar with the science, that, that might sound a little science fiction-y, right? Um, because that's a theme that's been in the science fiction literature for, for forever. Um, so one of the points I want to make is there's nothing science fiction or magical about slowing aging. Aging is really just biology, and nature has figured out how to modulate the rates of aging over many orders of magnitude. And so if you just look at some of these animals up here on this slide, you can see that, right? If you think about a fruit fly, that lives about three months. If you think about a dog, about a decade. Um, oh, some whales can live 200 years. Humans are somewhere in the middle. We're probably towards the higher end, but we're by no means the longest lived animals or the slowest aging animals 
um, on the planet. So nature has figured out how to do this. Um, and, and if you think about what's different between these animals, it's genes and it's environment, right? That's all it is. So, so aging is modulated by genes and environment in individuals and across the entire animal kingdom. So if, if nature has figured out how to tweak aging rates, it should be possible for us to do the same thing. So there's nothing magical about, about slowing aging or potentially speeding it up. Um, and there are also these cool animals that are sort of outliers um, uh, in terms of their genetics. So uh, that sort of weird wrinkly looking guy here, this guy, uh, is an animal called a naked mole rat. Some of you may have heard of naked mole rats. Um, these animals are very closely related to mice and rats. Mice and rats in the laboratory will live about three years. Naked mole rats live about 30 years. So they're genetically very close, yet they age 10 times slower. Why is that? And we can learn about some of these mechanisms of aging from studying these extreme long-lived animals or very slow agers. Um, the other point I want to make is, I, I, I think even though maybe you've never thought of it this way, probably all of you um, have, have gotten this idea, right? We all learn from a very early age that one human year is about seven dog years, roughly, right? What does that mean? It means dogs age about seven times faster than we do. So, so aging is malleable, and if we can understand it at a molecular level or a genetic level, we have the possibility of, of turning the knobs on aging and slowing it down. The other point I want to make is we're starting to figure it out. So I, I don't want to go through this long list of, of, of terms here. The point here is that this is a, a set of molecular processes that scientists in this field have identified that are fundamental to aging. They're called the hallmarks of aging. So we don't know everything for sure. There's a lot that we still need to understand about the biology of aging. But we've, we've learned enough about how this is happening mechanistically inside our cells that we can actually now go in and in a, in a rational way modulate these hallmarks of aging and slow down aspects of aging or maybe in some cases slow aging altogether throughout the entire animal. So aging is just biology. And biologists are figuring it out. And those are, I think those are a couple of really important ideas to, to take home with you today. So this is a really exciting time in the field. Um, and we even have some ways to do this now in the laboratory. So these are all either genetic changes we can make to the DNA of, of animals in the laboratory or environmental changes that we can make that at least in laboratory animals have been shown to slow aging increase lifespan, and in most cases, also improve health span or extend health span, push those diseases of, of aging back. Some of these will make sense to you, exercise. We all kind of get that, right? If, if people ask you, well, what can I do to, to be as healthy as I can as I'm getting older, right? Have a good diet and exercise. So it makes sense that those two things would be on this list. Some of these other things on this list are, are drugs and pharmacological ways to modify aging. And the one I'm going to talk about today is rapamycin. It's in, it's in red up there. And the other, the other word that's in red up there is mTOR. That's the, that's the target in the cells that rapamycin hits. So genetically, we can perturb this. Or with a drug, rapamycin, we can perturb mTOR. And we get increased lifespan, and we get improved health span. And that's true in all of these organisms that are showing up here. So what, what's at the top of this slide are the four commonly used model organisms in basic science study in laboratories like mine at the UW. Uh, budding yeast, a nematode worm called C. elegans, fruit flies, or mice. And in all of those organisms, if we give them rapamycin, they live longer, they're more active into late age, and they appear to be healthier. And I'll go into this a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, so what I want to talk about for the rest of the time today is our efforts to ask, can we start to come out of the laboratory and into the real world? And that's the Dog Aging Project. And if you're interested, um, that's the website, dogagingproject.com. Um, that dog in the middle is one of my three dogs. His name is Dobby. Um, and the idea here is that there are lots of reasons why our companion animals, our pets, make a really fantastic bridge between the laboratory models um, and people. And as, as I'll um, uh, say in a few minutes, that's not the only reason for doing this, though. There's, there's uh, intrinsic value if we're able to, to help our pets live longer and be healthier. I would love it if Dobby can live longer. 
Um, okay, so there's two parts to the dog aging project, um, and I'll take you through both of them. The first one is really uh, trying to understand aging in dogs. Can we, uh, at a very detailed level, understand what are the genetic and environmental factors that are most strongly predictive of healthy longevity in pet dogs. And that's, that's, a, that's the longitudinal study of aging. I'll take you through that in a minute. Um, the other aspect is, can we actually do something about it? Can we make our dogs live longer and be healthier through an intervention? And that intervention is rapamycin. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute as well. Um, so why dogs? Why not cats? Um, why not other animals? Um, I, I, and I, I like cats. I love dogs. I like cats. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's not the reason. Um, I think there are lots of reasons why uh, dogs are a really fantastic uh, uh, model. Um, and I don't really think of them as a model. I think of this, this as a, a, a valuable thing to be able to slow aging in dogs intrinsically. Um, so one is that dogs age very much like we do. Uh, how, many, how many of you have or have had dogs in the audience? All right, good crowd. Um, so, so dogs age very much like we do. And if any of you have had old dogs, you've probably seen this, right? Old dogs get arthritis. Um, many old dogs get cancer. Um, many old dogs show cognitive decline. I have three dogs. So, so these are actually my three dogs here. Um, that's Chloe, Dobby in the middle, and, and Betty. Um, Chloe has some cognitive decline. How do I know that? Because I find her staring at the wall sometimes, right? <laughs> So just like in people, dogs get essentially all of the same age-related diseases that we do. Um, and, and the risk of them developing those diseases go up exponentially with age. Um, now having said that, they don't necessarily get those diseases with the same prevalence that we do. So one example of this is vascular disease. Vascular disease is a major problem in people. It's not so much of a problem in dogs. Dogs are more prone to die from cancer. But all of the same diseases are, are exponentially associated with aging. So it seems as if, at a fundamental level, aging is very similar in dogs. It just happens about seven times faster. And one of the important implications of that is that if an intervention like rapamycin works in dogs, we can actually know the answer in a reasonable amount of time. Right? We can know, does rapamycin significantly increase lifespan in dogs in a five-year period, potentially, and I'll tell you how we're doing that. Um, dogs have, have this really cool genetic architecture. You're all familiar with the fact that we have, you know, a couple hundred different breeds of purebred dogs, which are very genetically similar to each other within the same breed. But then we have this overarching mixed breed population, and that genetic architecture is very powerful for trying to understand what are the, the, the features of the genes and the environment that are correlated with healthy longevity. They also have what's called phenotypic diversity. So if you think about almost any trait in a dog, it's, it, it covers a much wider range than it does in people. Think about body size, right? Compare a Chihuahua to a Great Dane. Um, that range for that trait is much bigger than it is for body size in, in humans. And so again, that makes it much easier to identify predictive correlates for things like healthy longevity. The, the one for me, though, that I think is really important is that dogs share our environment. And this is something, our pet dogs share our environment. And this is something we can't really capture in the laboratory, in laboratory models. Um, now, for those of you who raised your hand before, you don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to. But I'm sure that many of you have allowed your pet dog to sleep in your bed from time to time, right? Yeah, right, I'll own it, yeah. Uh, so it's hard to imagine an animal, again, maybe with the exception of cats, that shares our environment to a greater extent than our dogs. And so this is really powerful for understanding how much of what we've learned in the laboratory is actually going to apply in dogs. Um, uh, people love their dogs, and this project, I think, engages people in citizen science. Uh, the owners who participate in our studies are true citizen scientists. They're helping us collect the data, and I think that's really important. And most important for me is this isn't just about what we're going to learn about human aging, but by improving the quality and quantity of life for our pets, that has a, a actual value in and of itself for the owners and for the dogs. And I think that's really important. This isn't just about what we're going to learn about aging in humans. This is also about improving the health of the animals and the, the, um, the quality of life for the owners.
Okay, so first I'll talk about the longitudinal study of aging. So the goal here is not to treat the dogs with anything, right? The goal here is to monitor the dogs and try to understand which aspects of their genes and their environment are most important for healthy aging. Um, the plan is to enroll at least 10,000 dogs from around the United States. This will be dogs of, uh, uh, from uh, all sorts of different parts of the United States, all sorts of different genetic backgrounds. Um, so we want to look at genetic variation, right? This is really Im important. How, does, how do genes affect lifespan and health span in dogs? So the study is open to all breeds of dogs, um, mixed breed dogs. Uh, the dogs will all either have their genomes entirely sequenced or they'll, they'll have partial sequencing of their genomes, something called SNP typing, um, which gives us, if, if any of you have done like the, the 23andMe or the 23andMe for dogs, the wisdom panel, that's what they do. They do this, uh, this SNP typing, gives you a high resolution genetic information about the dogs. Um, and there are some really cool things I think we can learn from this. One example is if, um, probably some of you know what this dog is. Yeah, I heard it, Sharpe, right? Anybody know why that dog is wrinkly? I've gotten all sorts of funny answers to this question, too. I wouldn't really, I, you, you shouldn't know this unless you, you really like Sharpe's. Um, so, so actually, one person said, um, what, they used to be much bigger and they shrunk down, so they have a lot of extra skin. Um, no, so they have a high level of a, a molecule um, in their skin called hyaluronic acid. You see this sometimes in beauty um, skincare products. Um, it turns out this guy here, this naked mole rat, also makes really high levels of, high, of hyaluronic acid. And there's some reason to think that that's why naked mole rats don't get cancer. I told you they live 10 times longer than they should, um, at least based on their close relationship to other rodents. Part of the reason for that is they don't get cancer, or they, they get cancer like one in 10,000. Um, so is it the case that Sharpays are less likely to get certain forms of cancer than other dogs when you, when you normalize for body size. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, there's a little bit of a hint. But that's potentially the kind of genetic uh, relationship that, that we can build. The, the other one that I think is really interesting is body size. So big dogs age faster than small dogs. Why is that? It turns out the greatest genetic predictor of body size in dogs is this gene called IGF-1. It stands for insulin-like growth factor 1. Um, that, was, that was work that was done by Elaine Ostrander many, many years ago, showing that that's what mostly determines body size in dogs. Completely independent of that, studies in the basic biology of aging identified IGF-1 and components of that pathway as major regulators of lifespan. When you turn down IGF-1 signaling in a mouse or a fruit fly or a nematode worm, you extend lifespan and they appear to age more slowly. So it's plausible and probably the case that IGF-1 is really a major component of the region, reason why big dogs age faster than small dogs. Those are the kinds of genetic relationships that, that we can uncover through this large-scale longitudinal study of aging. But IGF-1 isn't everything, so there's other stuff out there to, to learn about. We also want to capture environmental variation. So just like in people, there are rich dogs. I don't know if you can tell. That's the dog house. That's the dog. Um, there are poor dogs. There are dogs with healthy lifestyle habits. This guy's exercising. There are dogs with questionable, just like Keith Richards, questionable lifestyle habits. No, um, not really. So dogs don't really smoke. I, I had nothing to do with that picture, by the way. I pulled that off the internet. Um, but dogs do experience secondhand smoke. Dogs do live in areas where air pollution is high. We'll get that information just from the zip code or the owner surveys that, that the owners complete. And so we'll be able, hopefully, to understand how do these sort of environmental factors influence health and longevity in, in dogs. Um, we'll also capture behavioral variation. So there's a wide, this is something that's really cool about dogs, right? They have this wide range of different interesting behaviors that could be related to cognitive function. Um, some dogs are active, some dogs like to swim, some dogs like to dig. These are my dogs laying on the couch. Um, so we'll be able to capture that. So the dogs in the longitudinal study will have little Fitbits in their collar, so we'll know how active they are. Um, so this is a huge project. Um, I haven't obviously gone into a lot of the details. There are dozens of different uh, 
measures that we're going to take, some of which, like genome sequencing, you know, have terabytes or petabytes of data associated with them. Um, so this is really what, what we think of as systems biology, where we're capturing this big data. And we know we've got a great team, but we know we're not going to be able to do all of this ourselves. So one of the important parts of the Dog Aging Project is to make this an open science project. As soon as we can, all of this data will go back to the owners in a format that they can use and also go onto the internet so that other data scientists can dig into it and hopefully discover some interesting aspects that we aren't going to be able to, to, uh, to discover ourselves. So there's going to be a lot of data generated from this longitudinal study. Okay. The second part of the dog aging project, which is what I'm particularly excited about now, is the possibility of actually slowing aging in dogs and helping our dogs live longer and live healthier. Um, and so this is through intervention trials, veterinary clinical trials designed to ask the question, does a particular intervention slow aging in dogs? Um, and the first one that we've started on is an intervention trial for this drug rapamycin that I mentioned earlier in my talk. So the goal here in this case is to determine whether rapamycin can increase lifespan and improve health span in pet dogs. The idea is to start with a low dose of the drug. So, you know, critically important, and, and I, I actually think this is, this is something that, um, that, that's worth taking a second just to, to mention. I view clinical trials in pet dogs the same way I would view a pediatric clinical trial. I think you need to think about dogs as people's children because that's the way a lot of people think about them. And so safety has to be the number one most important factor here, right? Um, and so we start with low doses of rapamycin where we're confident based on veterinary literature that it's very unlikely there are going to be significant side effects. And we ask, starting in middle-aged dogs, is that sufficient to improve some measures of health? And if it is, then we move on in a sort of stepwise fashion to do the long-term lifespan study. The hope is to get to a five-year study to really answer the question. And I'll tell you about what we've done so far and, and where we're at. So first of all, why rapamycin? So I mentioned that rapamycin has been shown to slow aging in laboratory models. Um, it's a really interesting drug. It was first discovered on Easter Island, which is also known as Rapa Nui. That's where the drug gets its name. If any of you are interested in a pretty accessible sort of um, background on rapamycin, there was this um, article in Bloomberg uh, Business Week a few years ago called The Forever Pill. If you just put that into Google, it'll pull it up. Um, uh, not only does it increase lifespan, though, but in mice, where we have a pretty good opportunity to actually look at health broadly, it seems to delay almost all, maybe all, of the declines in function and the diseases that go along with aging. And that's true across many different organ systems. So brain, so cognitive function is preserved or improved, muscle function, heart function, immune, kidney, you can read the list. Um, and I want to come back to this Alzheimer's disease uh, concept for just a minute. In Every single major mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, rapamycin has been shown if you start early to delay the progression, and if you start late, in several cases, to actually reverse progression of the disease. Um, rapamycin has not been tested in a clinical trial in people for Alzheimer's disease, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Um, and I'm, there's actually, I've got a, a perspective coming out in a, a journal called Science Translational Medicine soon that argues for that. It's very frustrating to me that the Alzheimer's disease community has not paid attention to the biology of aging um, because I think there's a reasonable chance that this, this could be beneficial in people. Um, that's a bit of an aside. Uh, the other thing about rapamycin that I want to mention, though, is at least for aging, it works, at least in mice, when you start in middle age. So you can start with a 60-year-old equivalent mouse, give it rapamycin. That's still enough to increase lifespan and improve these measures of health. And that's really important if we're thinking about translational applications, about bringing this out of the lab and into the real world. Because whether it's dogs or people, it makes a lot more sense if you have an intervention that can be started in middle age as opposed to something that you have to start when you're a teenager, for example. The risk of side effects are lower, and the likelihood of compliance is much higher. So that's really important. Um, and it turns out that even transient short-term treatments with rapamycin can have beneficial effects. So um, I think this is the one of only a, a couple of like real uh, primary literature data that I'm going to show. But this is really important, so I want to take you through it. So 
it turns out in mice that just like in people, heart function goes down with age. And this is looking at a particular measure of heart function that you can measure with um, something called an echocardiogram. It's like an ultrasound for the heart, so it's non-invasive. Um, you see this particular measure. This is, um, in this case, uh, this is E to A ratio. The three that are up there, eject ejection fraction, fractional shortening, and E to A ratio. I'm pointing out, because this is the same thing we looked at in our dog study. These are all measures of left ventricular function. So that's this chamber right here. And it's measures of how well is that chamber contracting. So you can look at changes in the size of that chamber with contraction, or you can look at the fraction of blood that's pumped out. That's what we're looking at here. So that goes down with age. And what you can see here, if you compare just young versus old in white, you can see that decline in function with age, young to old. The white is before 10 weeks, the after is after 10 weeks. Okay, so it goes down with age. Um, and then the, the experiment here was, what happens if you give the old mice either a control treatment or rapamycin, in this case for 10 weeks? And that's what you see in the black. You start before the 10 weeks, if you're an old control or an old mouse that hasn't gotten rapamycin yet at the same level, but if you get rapamycin, the heart is now functioning, at least by this measure, just like a young heart. So at least for this measure of age-related cardiac decline, short-term treatment with rapamycin 10 weeks is enough to make that heart start functioning like a young heart. That's pretty exciting, right? Same thing's true for immune function. I'm not gonna show you the data, I'm just gonna tell you. If you look at immune function in mice, just like in people, that goes down with age. Six weeks of treatment with rapamycin brings it back up to the young level, at least for flu vaccine response. This hasn't really been looked at for a lot of other measures of immune function. The cool thing here is there's data that the same thing's true in people. So Novartis spun out a company called RestorBio that has now done two clinical trials in healthy older adults, gave them either a placebo or their version of rapamycin for six weeks. They see that the, the people who got rapamycin have a better flu vaccine response, and they're also protected against respiratory tract infection for the next year. So it really seems like short-term treatment with rapamycin in both mice and people can improve at least some measures of age-related immune decline, which again, I think is really exciting. And then we can ask, what about lifespan? Um, and this is work from my lab. So we did an equivalent ex experiment where we took old mice, these are about, again, about 60-year-old equivalent mice, treated them with controller rapamycin, and then just waited. We didn't do anything to the mice. We let them live out their natural life. And what's shown here is a survival curve. So this is the, on the, the percent alive as a function of age. And when it moves like this to the right, that shows an increase in lifespan. So the mice that got three months of rapamycin after we stopped the treatment lived 60% longer than the mice that didn't get rapamycin. So heart function's improved, immune function's improved, lifespan is extended just from a short-term treatment in middle age. Um, and I, I wanna just emphasize this, the length of the lifespan extension in absolute days is actually bigger than the amount of time the mice got the treatment. We don't completely understand the biological mechanism for that, but it's pretty cool. It's, it's kind of interesting to think about. You almost would say that's rejuvenation, right, to some extent, partial. Um, we have no idea whether that's gonna be the same way in dogs or people. Um, but if it is, that would be about three to four years for a typical seven-year-old dog, or about 20 years for a typical 50-year-old woman. So um, not insignificant uh, effects on lifespan. Okay, so now back to dogs. So what have we done so far? So we've completed what we call phase one. This was a 10-week, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Um, uh, again, the primary goal here was safety, right? That's why we started with the short-term study, short study. We wanted to make sure that there weren't going to be any significant side effects. Um, but we also looked at heart function for the, exactly the reason that I showed you, because we knew in mice that 10 weeks of treatment with rapamycin was enough to see improvements in left ventricular function. And we could do it non-invasively. Again, these are people's pets, right? So we want to make sure it's safe, and we have to be sure that, that all of the things we're measuring are non-invasive, right? Make it as easy on the dogs and the owners as possible. Um, so using uh, 
echocardiography, we were able to look at heart function before and after the study. So, um, so this study is done. It was completed at a VCA veterinary specialty clinic in the Seattle area. 24 dogs were enrolled. Um, and again, they had to be at least six years old and at least 40 pounds. Six years old because we wanted a population that had already showed some age-related decline, and 40 pounds because big dogs age faster than small dogs. Um, no significant side effects were detected, which is great. That was, again, the primary goal. Um, and we had some evidence for improved cardiac function, and I'll show you one piece of data supporting that. Oh, and these, these three guys um, are three of the dogs that participated in, in that study. Rascal is on the top, Mouse is in the middle, and Sipowitz is on the bottom. Phase two is active right now. So this study um, is being performed at the Texas A&M Veterinary Teaching Hospital. Our lead vet, Kate Creevy, is a faculty member there. Um, this is a longer-term study, so this is a year-long study. The dogs will either get placebo or rapamycin for six months, and then we'll follow them for another six months. We want to see if there are any persistent effects um, from the treatment. Uh, uh, we're going to look at heart function again. Hopefully, we'll be able to replicate our positive results from phase one. We're also looking at activity, and we're looking at some measures of cognitive function in those dogs. Phase three is the real experiment to really answer the question, does rapamycin slow aging in dogs? And um, this is a five-year study. It will involve 600 dogs, again, double-blind, placebo-controlled. Neither the owners nor the scientists nor the vets um, will know which dogs are in which group um, until the end of the study. Um, and I'm happy to say this study is now funded. It was a long road to get there, but we were funded, and we will be actively enrolling dogs, hopefully, um, in the first part of next year. Um, we'll look at lifespan, um, but we're also going to look as comprehensively as possible at as many uh, measures of age-related function and age-related disease as, as, as we can to really try to answer the question, is rapamycin broadly improving health? Does it significantly increase lifespan? Okay, so back to phase one. Um, so this is a table of the side effects, and, and I think it's useful to illustrate um, what we were looking for. So every week, the owners in this phase one study got a survey that said, for all of those uh, specific uh, categories there, did, in the last week, did your dog show any signs of, of any of these? Um, and for those of you who've had an old dog, you will appreciate why it was important and continues to be important to have a placebo control group. There's a pretty good chance in any 10-week period that your old dog is going to have one or more of these side effects, right? And we need to know, is there a difference between the treatment and the placebo group? And the answer is no, no, no nothing, nothing that even really looks like a difference, but certainly nothing that was statistically significant. Um, so that was, that was very reassuring. The two at the bottom came out of sort of throwaway questions. So I said we had these specific questions. Did your dog show this, 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 this? Um, then we asked, in the past week, has your dog um, displayed any behaviors that you would associate as positive? abnormal behaviors, or has your dog displayed any abnormal behaviors you would associate as negative? And what came out of this, I don't know if this is real or not, um, we're, we'll find out in the next phase, um, was that about 50% of the owners whose dogs, whoops, sorry, were in the rapamycin group said their dog was more active. That could be real. You could imagine an intervention that is affecting aging. The dogs are feeling better, they're more active. So that's part of the reason why we really want to track activity with these doggy Fitbits. The one I think is is kind of funny, but could be real, is 25% of the owners whose dogs were in the rapamycin group said their dogs were more affectionate. And we did not ask them. This was not a prompt. We didn't say anything about, you know, how have your interactions with your dog gone last this week. Um, so that could be, I don't know if it's real, but you could imagine if rapamycin is affecting cognitive function, that the way we perceive, in many cases, cognitive function in our dogs is their interactions with us. And so it's interesting to think about the possibility that this might reflect changes in cognitive function that the owners perceive as affection. Now, this is, I'm only going to show you one of the, the, the three cardiac parameters that we looked at, but they all look pretty similar. So this is um, fractional shortening. Again, how well is that chamber of the heart contracting? And, I, and I'm showing you this for a reason. So this is the same data. It's the same data plotted two different ways. 
Um, on this side here is, is uh, just showing the average. Each one of these dots is a dog. And you can see the function is higher at the end of the study in the rapamycin group compared to the placebo group. But I think this is the more useful way to look at the data. This is their function before. This is the function after. Anything on the dotted line here means that dog didn't change during the study. Anything below the line means the function went down. Anything above the line means the function went up. I think you can appreciate that there are more of the rapamycin dogs, the red triangles, above the line than there are the blue dots, which are kind of evenly scattered, maybe more below the line. Um, suggesting that rapamycin is actually improving function, and this turned out to be statistically significant. The reason why I like this is you can also kind of see the dogs that seem to get the benefit, that's these guys here, are the ones that started with the worst function. That kind of makes sense, right? Not every dog, just like not every person, is aging exactly the same way. And it may be the case that some of these interventions are going to work better in the individuals that have the lowest function coming in. So again, that'll be really interesting to see if that plays out the same way um, in phase two. So now I'll just leave you with my last take home message, which is I really think we're at the point now where we probably know enough that we can increase the healthy longevity of pet dogs by three to four years. And I think that's really, really exciting. Um, I also want to make the point that, that I've talked about rapamycin because that's what we're testing first. But the, the, the basic science is continuing to progress. And it, there are, at this point, several additional interventions that I think could be tested and, and have a potential either in combination with rapamycin or alone to also improve healthy longevity in pet dogs. So it's exciting to think about as the science on the basic science side continues to improve the opportunities to bring this out into, um, into companion animals. And um, I didn't make this picture. This is kind of a funny story where, as you can imagine, there have been lots of people interested in this study and, and we've had lots of um, uh, media attention. And um, one, one of the articles that was written I didn't know they were going to title the article this. It was, this, this scientist wants your dog to live forever. Um, and then they put halos over my dog's head. And put a picture of uh, which is not, I, whoops, sorry, which is not what I'm talking about. We're not talking about making dogs live as long as people, right? But we're talking about 20, maybe 30% increases in healthy longevity now. Maybe we'll get up to 50%. And I think that's worthwhile, and I think that's important. And if we could do it in people, that would be hugely important. Um, but we're, we're not talking about immortality, right? And so I want to I make that clear. Um, okay, so the last uh, thing I want to do is just mention some of the people who've been involved in the dog aging project um, to date. Uh, so Daniel Promislow, who's also a professor of pathology at UW, is the co-director of the dog aging project, and he's really leading the longitudinal study that I talked about. Kate Creevy at Texas A&M is our lead veterinarian. Um, Sylvan Erfer is a postdoc working jointly with myself and Daniel who was involved in a lot of the analysis of the data from the phase one study. Um, my wife Tammy was the coordinator for the phase one study and she um, uh, really took charge of interacting with the owners and keeping them on task, um, which as you can probably imagine is a huge, uh, huge thing to do. Um, the dogs here were all participants in phase one with the exception of Dubs, the UW mascot, which <laughs> Daniel and I were lucky enough to get to go to a, a Husky football game and um, get to spend some time with Dubs, which was great. Uh, so with that, I will stop, and I'm happy to answer any questions that um, people might have. Thank you for your attention.